Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Rafael Del Nero. Based in Dublin, Rafael is a senior software engineer at MasterCard, a Java champion and Oracle Groundbreaker ambassador, and creator of the Java Challengers Initiative and Quizmaster in Oracle Dev Gym. You could follow him on Twitter at Rafael Del Nero, oh no, Rafa Del Nero, and check out his website at javachallengers.com. Rafael is the author of the Lingpa book, Java Interview Challenger, Ace Java Interviews by Mastering Fundamentals of Data Structures and Algorithms. In the book, Rafael helps you become a better software engineer capable of designing complex systems on your own and guides you through the interview styles in the current job market so that you know exactly what the game is during the interview and so you can prepare accordingly. In this interview, we're going to talk about Rafael's background and career, professional interests, his book and uh, books, actually. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a writer. So thank you very much, Raphael, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Thank you so much, Len. It's a pleasure to be here. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into the career that you've built. For sure. So I started my career in Brazil, in the big city, Sao Paulo. And it started something around 2010. So I didn't start with Java. I started with PHP. So I know that some Java developers don't like PHP, but it was a start as a developer. And then I worked uh, as a IT support person. So I was fixing computers for some time. And then I got a job with Visual Fox Pro, which is a very old programming language. So it's kind of the evolution of Clipper. It was fun to work with that because I learned how to create complex queries. I learned uh, business requirements. So it was an ERP system. So it was a big system. So the good thing is that I learned a lot about how to build real software in this company. And then finally started officially with Java. And I've been working with Java specifically for more than 10 years. And in my career, my whole career, more than 13 years. So there is uh, some time that I temp, uh, I've been working as a Java developer and yeah, throughout my career. So in the beginning of my career, I wanted to move abroad. Back in 2010, I decided, hey, like I want to um, move to Europe. I didn't know the country yet, but I had that in the back of my mind that I wanted to move abroad. And then in 2010, I started focusing on English and I was studying since then. And I had conversation classes. I was very consistent to be sharp with English because I knew that I would have to first be strong technically. I would have to get experience in Brazil and I would have to also be sharp with English because I would have to communicate. I would have to do a good interview to pass in, in, in a job and interview. And I didn't have a visa as well. So the challenge is much harder when you don't have a visa because then you have your skills. That's the only thing that can get you a job. Without the visa, it's much harder because you can you have to have a lot of experience so that's what I did. I was studying English. I was also uh, getting experience as a Java developer. And I learned a lot back in Sao Paulo. And then a f colleague uh, from my job, she went to Ireland and she got a job as a Java developer. And then I said, hey, maybe Ireland is a good option, you know, maybe it's a way to go abroad because it's a country they use English as the official language. It's a country where 
I can get a job as a Java developer because this colleague of mine got a job here as a Java developer. So I thought, hey, why not? And then I found out that to be an English student in Ireland was kind of one of the cheapest places in the world. And it was a good starting point. And then I decided, okay, that's my goal. That's my objective. So that's what I'm going to do. So I decided, obviously my mom didn't like very much. She wanted me to stay in Brazil, but I said, Hey, that's my objective. So you knew that this would happen sooner or later. And then when I was 27 years old, I decided, okay, I'm going to Ireland. And then I did uh, a country exchange course. So I came here as a student without a visa, without anything. So I had my courage and my, my skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I came here on my own and it was a big challenge because it was, you know, first time I was living on my own. So it was a new culture, new language, new everything. And I had to, you know, learn things on my own. And here, when I was here in Ireland, I noticed, okay, that's me, only myself. I have to figure this out. There is no parent, there is no family. It's only me. I have to figure this out. And ob obviously, I came here with the mindset that things will be hard. Things will be hard. I, I wasn't thinking that, oh, I'm going to have a nice place to stay. No. I was thinking, okay, things will be hard. In the first week, I was only on my laptop and to, to find a place to stay. Because here, it's very hard to find a place to stay. And then I was looking, like, instead of going out and enjoying the city, no, I was focused. I was saying, okay, I have to find a place. I had one week to find a place to stay. So... I focused, I checked all the um, houses, all the apartments in the city center. I went to some apartments that were pretty bad. And uh, then finally I found one that was reasonable, was good enough, was a modern apartment. Obviously it wasn't perfect because I just arrived here, didn't have a job. I was just a student. So... Obviously, I needed to save money. And then I got a bedroom sharing with more two people. So in the beginning, it wasn't, uh, wasn't easy. I had to share my room <laughs> with more two people. And I had to deal with people from other cultures, which was difficult. Their culture is completely different from the Brazilian culture. And I had to learn and adapt. And obviously respecting other people's boundaries. And I was so focused when I arrived here that I was only speaking in English. So when I arrived in this apartment, I told my flatmates, hey, I came here focused. So I won't talk in English with you. So we're going to make an agreement. Sorry, I, will, I won't talk in Portuguese with you. Uh, so we're going to make an agreement that we're going to be only talking in English. And that's what I did. I I never spoke one word in Portuguese with them because I was extremely focused. It was like my maximum priority. And that was it. When I came to Ireland, I burned the boats. There wasn't odd other option. Like it wouldn't be success or success. There wouldn't be the option of, oh, no, if that's things happen. No, I would stay here until I get the job. So uh, no matter what I would have to sacrifice, I wouldn't do it. I would get it no matter what. And uh, and then that was it. It was funny because my uh, flatmates, they said, they told me, hey, Rafael, I never heard you talking in Portuguese. And then it was funny because one day when I was talking with my mom on the phone, she doesn't speak in English. Uh, they told me, Wow, do you speak in Portuguese? <laughs> <laughs> it 
<laughs> they said, yes, yes, I have to talk in Portuguese with my mom. <laughs> and then, yeah, I was talking only in English. And of course, when I arrived here in Dublin, uh, I also got involved in a job as a group, Dub Junk. And that helped me a lot to improve my English because I, when I went there, I did a volunteer job and I mentored a lady to build the website for Dubjug. And I met many uh, Java references like Venkat Subramanian. Uh, so it was short after I arrived here in Dublin, Venkat was coming here to give a talk. And then I met him, it was amazing. So I met many good people here, Barry as well. Um, he's a jug leader from uh, Dubjug. And in this meantime, I was getting involved in this community. And I did some interviews. I didn't pass in some of those interviews. So I got frustrated when I didn't pass. But then I said, hey, that's part of the game. You have to fail to uh, be successful. And that's, that's fine. And then I learned some things on those interviews. And obviously, so I was sharing my knowledge as well. I was sharing knowledge about Java challenges. I was sharing knowledge about Java in general. And when you share your knowledge, you influence other people and people uh, see you. Okay, Raphael is a guy that I trust. And then that made all the difference because when I was going to the Java user group, some people recognized me. They said, hey, I like your content. And I said, oh, that's awesome. I didn't know you even knew my content. And then by, by talking to some friends, after I got rejected in some interviews, so this is the power of the community as well. So I said, hey, yeah, hello. I'm, I was talking to uh, a group there in, in the Java group. And then they told me, hey, are you looking for a job? Then I said, yes. And then uh, he told me, so his name is Rodrigo Rodriguez. So he helped me to get an opportunity. He said, hey, I saw your content and you have good content. So are you looking for a job? And then I told him, yes. And then he said, hey, there is a good company to get started here in Ireland. And then he recommended me. So that helped me. That helped me. I got my first job uh, in this company. So it was Equifax, the first company I got uh, hired here in Dublin. And that, that's my journey in a summarized way. Hope I didn't talk too much. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, uh, I had uh, the experience of moving abroad myself once. Um, uh, I had two things that made it a lot easier for me than it did for you. One, I had a friend that I, that I went abroad with. Uh, and the other one is I went to a country where I actually, it was my, my first language, I moved to the UK. But um, you were bringing back lots of sort of flashbacks from like, the courage and the drive that it actually takes to to do this kind of thing it might it might sound easy to someone who's never done it or oh, what's the big deal you just move and it's like you have to get like a health card you have to learn how, like you have to convince someone to give you an apartment i mean that's that's a big deal one question i have for you is so that first week when you were looking for an apartment were you staying at a hostel or a hotel or something like that that was a house from the school okay okay it was a house from the school in the beginning. Yeah, that that that's it's it's so interesting that that like that finding an apartment piece of it is actually can be incredibly hard, um, uh, and uh, and like you know take a lot of shoe leather as they say uh, to to find, um, and then you know you have no idea what ex where you're going to be. You might have like two or three flatmates, something like that, um, uh, and it, yeah, that that can be very hard. Uh, and so, uh, so when you were do you. Uh, since 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 uh, part of this interview is going to be about you know you interviewing, um, do you remember your first interview that you had when you were in Dublin? The first interview. So I had one interview last year, 
for a Brazilian Brazilian community, let's say. And they asked me about my experience of working abroad. Mm. And but it's not that common for speakers or Java champions to give interviews. So I didn't have many of them. So I had one interview as well for uh, Air Hacks. So it's a, an amazing podcast from Adam Bean. Oh yeah, sorry. So, I, I I should say, uh, do you remember your first job interview when you were interviewing for a job? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know oh, that, shit. that was me. I, no, no, I totally, I totally get it. No, no, because I, I just, <laughs> it's so, I mean, I remember doing the same thing myself when I, when I was sort of a young, you know, younger and like moving abroad and like I sort of got my first interview and it was like, it was a really big deal. Like I, I went, I, I moved to London with like no plan, uh, no, no connections, anything like that at all. Uh, do you remember what your first inter job interview was? Uh, yeah, maybe this part we can cut. <laughs> you didn't know that's, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So my first job interview was for a company called Toast. Okay. Yeah. I didn't pass in this interview. And it was a simple interview. It was a remote call. Oh. Yeah, and it was basically a code challenge. I don't remember very well how it was, but yeah, it didn't work, this one. And I had another job interview for another company version one. And then it didn't work as well. Maybe I wasn't that sharp with English. So they gave me a logic test and I failed once. And it was funny because a friend of mine told me, hey, it's going to be easy, Rafael. And then, okay, I was with the expectation that it would be an easy test. But it was a very weird test. I never had that test in my life. So there was some logic questions, some calculations, some weird things that... I don't know if I can say that for uh, this company. Um, yeah, you don't need to know <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe we, we've all, we've all had, yeah, no, we've all, we've all, I think, I think we've all had sort of like weird, weird interviews and stuff like that. It's a super interesting thing about like looking for a job and things like that is that like the comp you have a personality, you have a background, so does the company. Uh, and so does the person interviewing you. Um, and, uh, sometimes, you know, one can experience kind of antagonistic, uh, interviewers, you know, people who actually just don't like you for some reason. Um, yeah, that, that can be a that can be a feature of it. Um, I've had that experience at least once. It was very striking uh, and unprofessional. Um, uh, <laughs> and I sort of, all, all I knew was I just didn't do it, you know, um, uh, talk back a little bit because, you know, uh, you got to stand up for yourself. But um, but yeah, that's, that's a super interesting thing. And, and I'm just very curious. So at this stage, when you're interviewing, are you also, does the company that you're, were the companies that were interviewing you were they going to have to give you like a kind of visa themselves, help you with the visa process themselves? Yeah. So those companies were companies that they would help me with the visa because I just had the student visa when I arrived here. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the citizenship. Um, and then. Okay, after I didn't pass in the uh, version one interview, I got a job in Equifax and they gave me the visa. I think the name of the visa is Temp4. So it's a visa that enables me to leave here in Ireland for two years, but I can't change companies during right. those two years. Right. But after the two years, then I have the freedom to move to another company. So. That's how it works here in Ireland. And after five years, you can get the Irish citizenship if you want to. In my case, it was different because 
I got the Italian citizenship before that. So oh, okay. because my great grandfather came yeah. from Italy many yeah. years ago, went to yeah. Brazil, and then I have the rights to get the Italian citizenship. And then that's what I did because it made things so much easier. So then I didn't have to wait those three or four years to get the, the Irish citizenship. So just got the Italian one. And yeah, after that, things got much easier. But, it, you know, in the beginning, it was <laughs> everything I had to figure out on my own, had to get the the sponsorship from the company. Yeah. So it was hard. And uh, actually, this is a sort of, since, I, since I've done something similar in my own life, I have a kind of personal question. So when you moved to Ireland, how long was it before you went back to for a visit to Brazil? So not so long because my goal before going to Ireland was to get a job after four months because I wanted to study English as well. So I wanted to enjoy, I wanted to take advantage of the course I was doing because I was supposed to do a six months English course. Okay. But I said, okay, but I can't wait too much because I had eight months of visa. Okay. So I didn't have a lot of time. I couldn't wait until the sixth month and have only two months to look for a job. Mm -hmm. Then I said, look, I can wait three months and then I can start looking for a job. And that's exactly how it happened. After four months, I got a job and it was the breakthrough totally because when you get a job, things get so much easier. Yeah. No, you're able to afford better place. You are able to stay in the country. Don't need to worry about the visa. So things change a lot. And after I got the job, I knew that I wouldn't be able to take holidays for a long time, for at least one year. Mm. Then I said, okay, I'm going to go to Brazil before that. And then I stayed there for 15 days. So it was to answer a question more precisely. It was after something around five months. Okay. Uh, yeah, something around five months. I went there. I stayed 15 days there. And then I came back. And then I stayed one year uh, in, in Ike Fox. So, well, I stayed more. I stayed longer there. But um, I, uh, yeah, after this one year, I went after the... Italian citizenship, then it was another thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's so interesting. We could talk about these details a lot. I said one thing, I just again, sort of like bringing back flashback memories, you know, when you talk about like, you know, on, only four months. The thing about that kind of timing is that like when you go into it, you have no idea how long it's going to be, you know, uh, until you get to your goal, until you get, if, if you're even going to get a job, what it's going to be like how long that, that period is going to take. And so those periods of time of transition and uncertainty feel like, you know, every, every month feels like a year, um, uh, when, when, when you're doing it. Um, uh, so yeah, congratulations on getting through that and doing it completely on your own as well. That's, uh, that's, uh, really hard. It is. Thank you so much. Man. Yeah. Um, really hard. Uh, and, uh, just moving on, I guess, to the next part of the interview. So eventually, um, you became a Java champion, uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what that is uh, and how you how you pulled that off. Yeah. So Java champion is a very important title in the Java community. In simple words, the journey to become a Java champion is through sharing your knowledge. So if you share your knowledge with Java, and if you create a great impact with Java developers, giving talks, creating books, creating blog posts, or you can create a framework, you can create, um, you can work on the Java language itself, so you can create a book like the certification book. So one example is Gene Boyarski. So he's a Java champion as well. Joshua Block, 
He's another Java champion. He contributed to the Java language and he has the effective Java book. So there are many speakers as well that became a Java champion. So there are something around 300 Java champions. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Something around 300 I in the world. So, so few, yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to become a Java champion. You have to create an impact with the Java community and you have to influence them in a good way. So my journey started like that. I started sharing my knowledge about the Java challenges. Obviously, I didn't do everything on my own. I had a mentor, Bruno Souza, he's another Java champion. Mm. And he taught me the way to get there. And I shared my knowledge. I got involved in Java communities. And I created the brand Java Challenges. And it opened doors to me. It opened doors to me to give talks, to write books. For example, the Java Challengers and the Java uh, Interview Challenger. Those are books based on the branch Java Challenges. And the biggest key to become a Java champion is to share your knowledge, is to help Java developers as much as you can. You have to create a big impact to the Java community. The more you do that, the more influence you create, the more, more your reputation grows. And then the stronger is your reputation, other Java champions will notice you. So they will say, hey, Rafael is creating a lot of content, a lot of value to the Java community. He's been prolific. Let's nominate him as a Java champion. So Java champion is a community of Java, how can I say, not only influencers, but people from Java who creates a lot of impact, massive impact, creating frameworks, books, blog posts, courses. There are um, many different kinds of Java champions. So, and if another Java champion sees you as someone who creates value to the Java community, then they'll say, hey, let's nominate Rafael. Got it. Yeah. And then that happens. It's, it's, a, it's a community. There's no certification. There's no, um, like, there is bureaucracy, of course, but it's more of a community. So if a Java champion sees you as someone who brings this impact, sooner or later, you're going to be nominated. And obviously, you have to be consistent. So, and that's one thing that I learned very well, to be consistent and to create articles, to write the book, even on the days that I don't feel like it. And that's hard to do because it's not every day that you're going to be motivated. That's just how we are. And that's what I do. I write the book, I write the articles, even on the days that I don't feel like it in this discipline. So I built up my discipline. Thank you very much for sharing those details. That's a really, really kind of gold for people who are uh, starting out or sort of trying to do something like that. Because often you hear, oh, yeah, you know, I just started blogging and then the next day is success, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but you know, but telling the story of like, you know, like putting out content consistently, this is one of the things that like I hear, I hear all the time is that like, and, and it's not, it's like for so many different things, not just sort of like, you know, becoming a Java champion, not, I mean, uh, or, or, or something else, but like, doing things consistently, having a schedule and sticking to it is just so important for getting discovered for other, and like for other, like for other people to trust you and see that you're like a, you're serious about what you're doing. This is one of the, one of the sort of subtle things, uh, when, you know, especially when you're young and sort of trying to figure things out, like other people are looking at you, they don't know who you are. They don't know what's in your heart, but if they see you doing something consistently, that actually really sets you apart from not, 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 not everybody else making you better than them, but just that, like, they know what kind of a, per what you're up to and that you, and that you mean it. Um, and exactly. actually, 
on that note, I have a very, so, so for someone listening, who's like, wants to, you know, become sort of like, you know, sort of like make content. They really, they have it in their heart. They want to help. They've got things they would, they want to, they want to help other people and learn themselves at the same time. So here's a very specific question for you. If you're starting out to do something like, like what you've done, should you start with like a medium blog or should you start with your own website and brand? That's an amazing question because I get this question a lot from my MTGs. Well, I didn't tell you, but I'm also a mentor. Oh, so course, yeah. yeah, help a developer in their careers. And they asked me a lot on how they should get started on writing articles. And I always tell them to start um, in a platform where it's the easiest. Mm. Because I know how hard it is to get started. Mm. And I don't want to create another barrier to get started. Mm -hmm. So what I would say, hey, start on Medium. I would say start on DevTO. DevTO is a very focused uh, platform for developers. You can even start on LinkedIn. I don't think it matters too much, the platform you choose. But what matters most is if the developer is delivering the content. Because in the beginning, it's going to be a learning curve. In the beginning, in the first one year, you're going to be developing your voice. So in the beginning, you can't also be afraid of being criticized. I know this is a big fear from developers. In the beginning, really nobody cares because it, in the beginning, you don't have enough of an audience. In the beginning, you don't have many people seeing your article. So it's totally fine to just deliver, just get it done. And obviously get your article, get your video, whatever you want to create in a reasonable state. Obviously, in, in a good state, in a way that's going to create value. But at the same time, don't be afraid of being criticized. Because in the beginning, nobody cares. So it takes time until you get traction. The most important thing for developers who want to create content is to get started. Get started on LinkedIn, on DevTO, or, or Medium, whatever the platform you want to get started. Because that's not the important thing. The important thing is to keep creating the content consistently. And they have to decide, am I going to create articles every week? Is that reasonable? Okay, so I'm going to stick to my schedule. If they decide, no, it's impossible weekly. So bi-weekly. Okay, decide beforehand, bi-weekly articles. Or monthly, create monthly articles, but be consistent. That's the most important thing because if you start creating articles and you stop, then people don't take you seriously, like you said. Mm -hmm. And it's crucial. It's very important to be consistent. That's one of the biggest keys for our success in your career, consistency and strategy. Obviously, you have to be strategic, you have to be focused when you write your articles. You don't want to start writing articles about everything. Otherwise, you're going to compete with the whole world. Mm. Pick a niche, a very focused niche where you're going to stand out. And then you're going to grow much faster because then you're going to be the very best in the world in this specific niche. And then you grow much faster because then you're going to say, hey, people will say, hey, that's the guy of the Java challenges. So I picked a very specific niche. Mm -hmm. So Java challenges, who does, who does that? No, no one, it's just me. So, and obviously after some time you can expand, but in the beginning it's very important to be focused. So I would say, hey, pick whatever platform and just be, just be consistent. And also another thing that's important when you're creating content is to choose a focus, choose a reasonable focus, something that you're very passionate about, and try to create at least 20 titles beforehand. Mm. Create 20 titles beforehand just to see, hey, is that a focus that is worth it? Is that something that I'm passionate about? 
If you're able to create 20 titles, yes, you're passionate about. If you're not able to create that, then maybe change your focus. That's a, that's that's really amazing advice. I was watching a uh, marketing video the other day where someone talked about uh, the riches are in the niches, um, uh, which is sort of cheesy, but like it's true. Um, focusing in and like that's that's such great advice there that too like like challenge yourself like so you so you want to pick an, a niche sure uh, but can you come up with twenty things that you would write about that uh, and not beating yourself too much when you're going through the exercise it's like if you can't come up with twenty you didn't fail a test you showed yourself that this actually isn't the niche for you uh, so tr try another one um, and I really like what you said too about like you know the first year you know I I, I definitely suffer from the syndrome of like. If, if I tried something and it didn't work in 15 minutes, oh my God, I failed. Uh, but like no one's watching, no one cares. Um, you know, it's, you, if you, you can actually just sort of take a year to try something. You can try a number of different things if you want at the same time. But keeping in mind that like things take, success takes time. It takes effort. It takes strategy, as you say, and planning and things like that. But not beating yourself too much along the way. Just, you know, I also presumably also do something that you actually genuinely enjoy yourself, right? Um, uh, that you actually want to do. If it's punishment, uh, that it's not something that you're going to be consistent at in the end. Exactly. Yeah. And in this process, you have to have faith as well. Mm -hmm. Because for example, when I was sharing my knowledge in the beginning, nobody even knew who I was. So I had zero likes on Twitter, had zero likes to other platforms. That was it. I continued with faith and I was doing the work anyway. And then, like you said, with consistency, people notice you. But without consistency, it's difficult to know. It doesn't happen. So you have to trust the process and do it uh, even though you don't have any results. You just focus, okay, that's the process. That's how I'm growing. That's how I'm getting better. Because that's the thing. The more you do something, the more you do podcasts, the more you do articles, the more you write books, the more uh, courses you create, the better you get at. Uh, speaking of which, um, you're I'm moving on to the next part of the interview. Your latest book uh, is, uh, that I believe, is Java Interview Challenger, Ace Java Interviews by Mastering Fundamentals of Data Structures and Algorithms. Um, and, uh, I've taken a look at the book. It's really good. It's really practical. It's really interesting. You get into details of like CVs and stuff like that. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about who the book is for. Well, thank you so much. So the book is for mostly intermediate and senior developers okay. who want to get a job in uh, Java positions and most companies are doing the interview process like that. So they're going to ask you a lot about algorithms, data structures. They're going to ask you about graphs. So it's pretty much like that. It's different from some years ago. So some years ago, the interviews were based on Java and some frameworks, mm. some clean code techniques, and that was it. There wasn't that much. But nowadays, the game changed. Nowadays, they're asking a lot about algorithms, data structures, and all of those things. And in the Java interview challenger, you're going to see there all the kinds of interviews that uh, they are asking, that they are doing the market. I've done lots of interviews and the majority of them is about the structures and system design, but there are other interviews as well that they will ask you about Java concepts and architecture, microservices, or they're going to talk about your experience. So. There are different kinds of interviews. I put all of those interviews, all of those interview styles in the book because I know it's important for developers to know what's the game. You need to know what's the game you're playing. Otherwise, you, how can you win the game? Because, you know, the interview is just a game. It doesn't mean, like, if you fail an interview, it doesn't mean that you're a bad developer. It just means that you failed that game 
and because you don't know the rules of that specific game. So that's why I created this book to show, okay, that's how the game is played. Those are the rules and master those rules and you're going to win the game because it doesn't, the interview doesn't prove that you're a good software engineer. It's just a game that they have there and you have to play it. And um, so the book is very focused on that game, data structures, algorithms, and systems design, because most of the companies will do interview like that. They're going to ask you a very vague question. They're going to say, hey, design Instagram, design YouTube, design uh, Netflix. And then you have to design a system in 45 minutes. Mm. And then there are a lot of tricks. You have to ask uh, questions to create the system in, a, in the most simple way. And you can't make it very complicated. If you start designing the system without asking questions, you're already rejected. So there are a lot of details, small details that if you don't follow those small details, the interviewer will say, hey, he didn't even ask what are the requirements. Started designing the system without even knowing what was, what was the, the system. And they're going to reject you because of those small things. So if you know the rules of the game, it's different. You you are far more likely to win the game. And if you go unprepared, if you don't know all of those small things, and if you make a lot of mistakes on those small things, you're going to be rejected. And that doesn't mean that you are a bad software engineer. It just means that you don't know this game. You have to learn how to play this game. And this started happening after the big companies decided, hey, those are the these are this is the way that we get the talent. We have to focus on fundamentals. And they are not wrong because knowing fundamentals has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. If you know how to create a good algorithm, you can code in any programming language because every programming language is based on our algorithms. So it's a very valuable content, a very valuable information to know as well. And system design enables you to create your own system. So there is a lot of value. So even though, okay, it might be annoying to go through all of those fundamentals, sometimes you don't use that on your day-to-day -day work, but be sure that you're going to be using that indirectly. So you're going to be using algorithms. You're going to be using all of those fundamentals, maybe in a higher level. Because if you know, if you see Java, Java implements all of those fundamentals. Every programming language implements all of those fundamentals. So by learning those fundamentals, you learn much more quickly any tool, any technology. Because all of those technologies that are launched every day, all of those shiny toys, they are all based on fundamentals. So I always tell developers that it's much better to master fundamentals instead of learning all those uh, shining tools, all of those shining technologies, because they're just tools that implement the fundamentals. And the thing is that if you are just learning tools and frameworks and um, technologies, your learning curve will be slower, always slower, and you're going to be learning tools which means that it doesn't make you a quick learner. For you to make a quick, to be a quick learner, you have to understand the fundamentals and master the fundamentals because then things make sense much more quickly, far more quickly. You become a quick learner. Thanks very much for sharing all that. That's really great. And just a sort of taste of like what there is uh, in depth, in depth in the book. Uh, lots of really great advice. One thing I, I really liked about what you said there was that if you're sort of like, if you're in an interview, you're sitting there, you're on the hot seat and you're being given a challenge, it's actually really important to ask questions. Um, uh, they're, they're actually, they don't just want you to sort of like take what they give you and go off. They want to see that you're like looking around the edges of what they've said, that you're being, you know, anticipating what the challenge might be and what else you need to know and looking for specifications and requirements, and requirements that they might not have been explicit about and that they maybe even they haven't thought about. Uh, and so asking questions like that is a, is a really great kind of tactic uh, for impressing people in interviews, but also for like getting to the right solution uh, as well. 
Um, just moving on to the last part of the interview where we talk about your experience as a writer. So you've written, you've written some books, you've written some courses and things like that. Um, when you sat down to sort of write this latest book, um, did you, uh, Java interview challenger, did you, did you have like an outline that you sort of completed in advance? Like, this is exactly what I want to do when I write this book, or did you just, did you, did you make it from blog posts, things like that? Yeah, it was a mix of both because I was writing some articles about algorithms, but I wanted to consolidate all of this knowledge in a book because then developers will be able to get all of this knowledge in an organized way where they can absorb all this content in a structured and organized way and then they can learn it much faster so it was a mix because i had an outline i so i wanted to cover all the little structures all the basic searching algorithms and i wanted also to go deeper in the java programming language that's something that I don't see in other books or courses. So if you see in the Java interview challenger book, I explored those algorithms and those concepts in the JDK code from Java. So I show in practice how those algorithms are implemented in the Java programming language. And so I organized the content in a way that, okay, I'm going to explain the basic algorithms. I'm going to explain how those algorithms are used with the Java programming language. And I'm going to also explain some algorithms techniques that will help the developers to solve a coding challenge more easily when they have those uh, interviews, those coding challenge interviews. Yeah, no, thanks very much for sharing that. It's really great to hear about how these things these things are constructed. And like, I mean, I think, you know, sort of like one can take it for granted, like a well-constructed book just seems to flow, but there's actually a lot of sort of thought that goes into, into how it's structured in advance by authors. Uh, and also, of course, they move things around as they, as they go along. Um, but, but your book is very well structured. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, no, that's really interesting to hear about how you went about creating it. Um, the, the last uh, question that I always like to ask uh, on the podcast, if the guest is a Lean Pub author, is um, if there was one feature, magical feature, we you could ask us to build for you that would change your life as an author, or if there was one thing that had you shaking your fist, damn you, Lean Pub, every time you went on our website that we could fix for you, is there anything that you could think that you would ask us to to do for you? Oh yeah, I would appreciate so much if you had integration with email uh, tools. Okay. Because for example, when um, a developer purchases the Challenger developer, sorry, the Java Challenger or the Java Interview Challenger book, yeah, I don't have any way to know if they purchased the book. And that would be great if you can add an integration specifically with the active campaign tool. I don't know, all of those email tools that are the most popular, because then I can tag the developer to say, hey, this developer already purchased the book. Be then I don't I, I don't want to send an email to them again mm -hmm. of the book if they already purchased the right. book. So that would be amazing if you could add this feature because I miss that so much. I would say, oh my God, this just, I don't want to send the same email to a developer who already purchased the book. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. That's no, that's, that's really interesting and really great feedback. Um, the one thing, one thing I would add about that is that, um, on LeanPub, we do have, we do have a couple of ways for people to share their email address with the author. Um, uh, so when, when, when your book is not published yet, there's a sort of form that people can fill out and they can share that they can take a box. They can say, notify me when this book is published. And there's actually a tick box that they can say and say, share my email address with the author. 
Um, and then, and actually after people buy your book, they can choose to share their email address with you as well. And that goes into a place that I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you after we're done the interview. Um, but you've got a, you've got a, a customer's page basically for each book where you can see a list of people who've shared their email address with you. Um, so that's, that's like the, our kind of crude, uh, way of, of, of sort of sharing email address. You could download a CSV and stuff like that, but we definitely have no like integration. I mean, well, we do have a kind of MailChimp integration type of thing, but it's not nearly as sophisticated as it could be, uh, like you're describing. And that's really great feedback and something that I'm definitely going to sort of share, uh, with the team, uh, because you know, that, that sort of like making sure like, you know, people who share their email address with you, like knowing like, oh, I've already sent them a thank you email. I don't need to send them another one. Uh, or they, they, what they're look, really looking for is this or that as a next step of kind of engagement and stuff like that is really important. Um, well, uh, Raphael, thank you very much for taking some time out of uh, what I assume was a beautiful evening in Dublin that you could have been out you know, at the pub or something like that. But instead, you, uh, do you talk, to, talk to me and talk to our audience. And thank you very much for uh, choosing Lean as one of the platforms for distributing your uh, content. Thank you so much, Len. It was really amazing to talk with you. And yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, it was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.